Of course, the book uh, which is presented at the table there, Dissonant Memories, Fragmented Present, is not a book published by the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Nonetheless, we are uh, quite happy to um, present it today um, because uh, the question of, of uh, identity and the question how to uh, deal with uh, memories, historical memories, especially on the topic of the Shoah is uh, some aspect which in our work in Germany is quite important. And of course we are asking, like many institutions do, how to continue these uh, politics of memory when uh, the people who survived the Shoah will not live in a few years' time. Dissonant, memory, dissonant memories and fragmented present Exchanging Young Discourses Between Israel and Germany is a publication sponsored by German Money. The foundation, EFZ, meaning Remembrance, Responsibility and Future, Connect, a foundation promoting German-Israeli exchange projects, and ISF, Action for Peace and Reconciliation, are all German. Its two editors, Cornelia Siebeck and me, Charlotte Mislitz, are German, and Transcript is a German publishing house. Yet, this book claims to be a German-Israeli publication. Its writers, coming from artists, academic, activists, or journalist backgrounds, describe their present-day situations and positions within the memory discourses of both society in Israel and in Germany. They exchange and uh, fathom, fathom the experiences triggered through confrontations and encounters with the so-called other, be it German, Israeli, migrant, or Palestinian, and by choosing authors from the different spheres, this publication imagined to keep a balance. Still today, maybe we launch the book in Israel. However, the presentation gets hosted by a German foundation, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. The German weight is conspicuous. There's an imbalance, to say the least. The history, my history is full of uh, the history of, uh, of uh, Jews from Europe, but it's lack of the history of my family that came from uh, Yemen. The, the significance of this lake is in the political uh, meaning of it, because um, uh, when you create a narrative, a national narrative, uh, it's something that is, uh, get it, uh, uh, brings significance to the collective, and uh, it explains policies, it can gather uh, the the society uh, around uh, national goals, and uh, it has political meaning. I was then uh, uh, working in, as a human rights lawyer, and I was dealing with permit issues, Palestinians that were denied uh, permits into Israel. I was living inside of this labyrinth of documentation and, and categorization where some people were dangerous and others were not, where you never knew if you would become dangerous and when you would become dangerous and what action you, 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 you took that would then make you into a dangerous person. And um, I realized that uh, Arendt had written about this and when she talked about having objective enemies and suspect populations. And what and an objective enemy means that it doesn't matter basically who you are. Your actual identity turns you into an enemy because you bear the phantom of the security threat. You are the phantom of, of uh, in this case, the terrorist, in the German case, basically all, all, that, all that is evil over the centuries. Um, I've been brought up in the GDR and I've been brought up in a critical family. The GDR always kind of uh, transported the understanding that they were or we were the state of the Germans that have learned the lesson. We were the state of the good Germans. It went so far that um, the Berlin Wall was even called an anti-fascist protection wall sometimes, um, implying that um, West Germany, of course, was um, the state of the Nazis. Um, that's where they all went, because there were no Nazis in East Germany anymore. Um, of course, the the Third Reich played a big role in um, the education system as well. Um, we went to concentration camps fairly early. Um, I went there even before I went there with class with my mother. Um, she stressed the uh, learning, uh, she stressed teaching the past to her children a lot. 
Um, the main narrative in Germany has it that once you've um, displayed your unconditional support for Israel, you've drawn all the right consequences. Um, your moral stance cannot be questioned anymore, pretty much. It goes so far that I have people coming up to me um, explaining to me that they can't be racist because they're not anti-Semites, um, which is insane. Of course, you can be racist without being an anti-Semite. In Germany, um, the left uh, has a very strong uh, motivation to keep the memory of the Shoah alive. And uh, there's been dozens of campaigns against forgetting and for holding up the memory of National Socialism. There's been, uh, uh, there's been, since the beginning actually of the Federal Republic of Germany's efforts to scandalize the continuity from Nazi Germany to West Germany, whether it's the bureaucratic com uh, continuity or the social or the cultural or whatsoever by the left. And even today, many uh, leftists fight for a final compensation for all slave laborers during Nazi Germany and uh, fight against the rewriting of history in which uh, Germans are going to be perceived primarily as victims. I was talking about a postcard, um, this postcard um, that I found in, uh, in a secondhand bookshop. And um, it's a postcard that has um, a picture of Akhziv, which was uh, the, the village Al-Zib uh, until 48. It says in English, Akhziv, ruins of an abandoned Arab village in West Galilee, used to be an important town in biblical times. At the beach are remains of an ancient harbor. Today the place uh, serves as a holiday village of the Mediterranean Club. Um, <coughs> So it has this, uh, in its template features, it has, uh, it, it transfers the hegemonic uh, narrative. After having read uh, the, the essays of uh, our panelists, uh, I believe that they all speak to at least three interrelated issues. The first is the role of collective memory in shaping collective identities. The second is the relative position and place of various groups and individuals with respect to memory and identity in, this, uh, in each of uh, these two fragmented societies. We, I think we've heard uh, some of it uh, in, the in the previous uh, uh, panel. And third, and finally, the daily management of imposed identities, marginal or central, in the broader and immediate context. It, it starts with my grandmother, in, uh, in a way, because, because I remember when I was a, a very little kid, she, she got two different stories to tell us about the Holocaust. When she was mad, very mad about the Jews, for example, after the uh, first Lebanon uh, war and Sabra and Shatila, she said, Hitler killed six million of them. After one week or another week, she, the, 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 the Germans never touched them. They are just <laughs> inventing stories. The identity of the Jewish people is built on this Holocaust. So every Jewish, every Israeli guy or, or woman, anyone Israeli in this country, his identity is built on the Shoah, on the Holocaust. So I'm asking of the Palestinians, we had the Nakba in 48. This is part of our identity. Palestine used to be our country before the Israeli people came here. And the Nakba somehow is is being erased, is being deleted by the laws of Israel. What do you think about that? Shouldn't it be part of our identity? Shouldn't we fight for it? I think that the Nakba is the major uh, national uh, identity of all Palestinians, of course. And, but I'm really, really very sorry that it's either the Holocaust or the Nakba. I, th I, I hope that the nationality of our people, the new generation of people who share values will be, I don't know, rock concert that establish your nationality. It, it doesn't have to be a catastrophe. Everything I wrote, well, being a graduate student and an irresponsible scholar completely infatuated by fashionable uh, theories, is uh, very much based on, uh, well, the writings of Walter Benjamin, uh, namely in the, the, his thesis of history, where uh, he says, well, that the past is not what happened and that the role of an historian is not representing the past as it happened, but is to grasp a memory that flashes in a moment of danger. On the one hand, 
is the tendency of conformism, of uh, positivist uh, historicist thinking, of incorporating a history and the past into some kind of narrative that uh, will justify and uh, make everything seem right and acceptable. Like for one hand, Yiddish, the whole Yiddish culture, the whole uh, drama and tragedy of the encounter of the shtetl with modernism is summed up by a racist apologetic play like uh, Fiddler on the Roof, or the Holocaust is incorporated into a narrative that just justifies the barbarity of Israel. So what happened in the 90s was that uh, anti-racism really became the main focus of the whole left in, in uh, Germany and that many thousands of migrants organized themselves uh, either from first, second or third generation to fight this uh, racist attacks and pogroms back and um, fight very militantly also. Um, but what they did in this strong self-organization was um, they, and they had to, uh, it was a question of surviving, but what they did was uh, as building up a strong migrant identity uh, to take a stand against it. But this identity also proved to be what we call an identity trap. So there was a lot of discussion in the later 90s then uh, where this uh, kind of organization leads to this strong notion on migrant identity. Because uh, what was also very clear was uh, that all um, this uh, identity politics was based on exactly this, um, all these uh, categories that were um, posed onto, um, onto the migrants or where they were subjected under to, like all the stereotypes. Um, so it was also an identity trap because they fight against racism, but on this, in the same time they fulfill and affirm all these uh, categories and that were projected on them uh, drew, uh, through a, a racist discourse. First, I wanted to make clear that the book has a very strong German part about German society as well. We slipped here very much in an Israeli-Palestinian type of discussion, which is not the, at the core of the book. And, and this is not only for moral reasons, but to see that there, I mean, it was about both societies and it was young politically conscious people reflecting on their societies on the role of history and memory and identity. Uh, what I tried uh, to say that me as a Palestinian woman, our voice uh, uh, was excluded excluded from the uh, oral and the written history that's uh, about the Palestinian people. And what we are trying to do with the feminist movement is to show our perspective that we are, we are not only a Palestinian minority, also we are a gender minority that suffered double from this uh, occupation.